Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited today and excited this week that we're joined by Sam Peltzman from the University of Chicago. Um, I've studied regulation myself in my career, uh, not nearly as extensively, but I've always admired his work and he's one of the top economists in the world. So Sam Peltzman is a Ralph and Dorothy Keller Distinguished Service Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Chicago. His research has focused on the interface between the public sector and the private economy, including issues related to the economics of regulation, regulation of banking, automobile safety, pharmaceutical innovation, the growth of government, the political economy of public education, and the economic analysis of voters and legislators. He previously served as senior staff economist for the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and he received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. So as you can tell, he studied a lot of extremely interesting things. So welcome, Sam. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. Uh, hold, hold the applause till, <laughs> till later. <laughs> what that introduction tells you is I've been around a long time, <laughs> which is true. So it's, it's a big favor to, to us, to NDSU, for Sam to come here. I, uh, I'm very grateful that he's here today. And Sam's uh, career, as you see, he studied a lot of issues related to the interaction between the public sector and the private sector. But one of the areas that you're most known for is your area of regulation. So I'd like to ask you a few questions about uh, your research in the area of regulation. Sure, so, go ahead. Yeah, and so uh, first of all, so you and your professor, uh, your PhD professor, George Stigler, and others at the University of Chicago developed an economic theory of regulation that takes into account the political process and the way that the political process shapes regulation. Uh, prior to that new theory of regulation, the theory of regulation said that regulation takes place because government needs to regulate an industry to correct some kind of a market failure. Uh, the, the very famous quote in the first article developing this theory by George Stigler said that as a rule, regulation is acquired by the industry and it's designed and operated for its benefit. And so I'm wondering, what was the reaction uh, just in general to that new theory? It's completely counter to the initial theory. And then what was the reaction within academia? Well, there's a background to it that's, uh, that's important to, one, to, to, to answer that question. As, as you pointed out, uh, when I was very young, the, 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 the view of regulation was that it was there to correct some market failure, and uh, uh, it was uh, the, the study of regulation was well. How can you tweak the regulatory uh, structure to make it more or less do that? Uh, before uh, 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 Stigler wrote that piece with the famous uh, quote, uh, there was a there was a whole ten year period in which, and he was a big innovator in that period as well, of actually examining what it is that happened when you got a regulatory agency set up to ostensibly correct some uh, market failure. And it was, uh, it was uh, when you actually looked at what happened, it wasn't always, in fact, it was very frequently not what the textbook view of regulation uh, was. Uh, Stigler was a character who liked to state things in its most outrageously exaggerated uh, position. So he wrote the article, it's now 51 years old, uh, which had as its punchline, you know what? Regulation isn't some device that helps you and me necessarily. It's acquired by the industry that it's that supposedly is is needs its market failure corrected. It's acquired by them for their benefit. That's a vast overstatement. But that was the back. The background was we had this very naive view. We started looking at what the actual uh, uh, outcomes were. 
and uh, they were often uh, quite uh, disappointing. And, and uh, his his statement of the theory was so extreme that uh, it everybody's eyes lit up. They didn't necessarily uh, disagree or agree. It wasn't that that he was a a, a loner uh, out in the wilderness. The time that this appeared was also conducive to this kind of uh, uh, skepticism. Uh, we, we've been through a period in which uh, e e uh, economics in general was was beginning to question uh, 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 the, the interface between government and the private uh, uh, sector. Uh, uh, e e economists were initially very optimistic about how the public sector could help the private sector perform well and that was diminishing because the economy the whole economy wasn't performing very well under the tutelage of people who thought that that you could minutely regulate the the flow of economic activity there was a whole bunch of forces that fed into the the time was right uh and the the spokesman was right because he wasn't afraid to make a very bold statement and say well prove me wrong and people tried, and some did, and some didn't. <laughs> so yeah. that's a long answer to a, your question. Yeah, so it's super interesting. And so, um, so you just said that it's been you know fifty one years since Stigler's initial article, yes, which yeah. made and you you said that made this kind of outrageous statement, maybe exaggerated statement. So, how well do you feel that the theory of economic regulation? I know you've built upon built some nuances into this, but how well has this theory held up over time? And, you know, is it true what Stigler initially said? Well, uh, uh, the, there's a trajectory. It, 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 it kind of took, well, uh, the, the, the theory developed because, uh, as I said, the, you know, the, the initial statement is way, way exaggerated. There is a, a very important element of truth in it, which is that, the interest of the regulated industry is going to be articulated in any regulatory context better than the interest of the people who are who are uh, the customers of that regulated industry or or the suppliers to that uh, uh, industry uh, uh, and almost in that uh, in, in that order the suppliers are going to be more more are uh, important to the regulator than the ordinary consumers and the industry is going to be important but it's it's too much to say that the industry just gets what it wants and the 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 uh, uh, the development of the theory what I was associated with some of that was to try to show when first of all uh, who if it's not just the industry who is it that the regulator is uh, are going to be uh, serving, and uh, uh, can you can you figure out under which conditions will one group get more, which conditions will one group get less? That that theoretical structure became, I think. Uh, the canonical theory of regulation that was taught to graduate students who were uh, become, uh, specializing in, in regulation. And it, it, it probably still is, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of on the decline. We're getting back in economics, probably in the world, to, uh, uh, to ignoring some of the lessons of that era. Where we, we, we're approaching regulation more as a, uh, uh, in the same naive way we used to before Stigler wrote that article. One reason why it's so durable, uh, pe people are uh, shocked, still shocked, <laughs> 50 years later, to know that regulation isn't just going to serve a broad public interest because that's what we elected them to do. We think we didn't. We think. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it's had a trajectory. Probably, it's waning now. Uh, 
uh, broad general questions about what does regulation in broad terms try to do are not really being asked as much in economics today. It's more a case by case kind of uh, 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 case by case kind of study. And it suffers from a lot of selection. You know, if you're if if you're of a mind to ignore all of the reasons why regulation can't or won't serve a broad interest, if you want to ignore them, you pick a you pick a problem where it's likely that you're going to find the answer that you like, and 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 uh, 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 that accelerates the drift away from asking that kind of question. So. Again, a long answer to a, so an brief, important question with a lot of nuances. So a super brief uh, follow-up on that. So do you see there being a shift back to, to uh, graduate education, putting more importance on, on the general theory? Than, you know, the, I, I don't see it. I, 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 no, I don't see it coming. I think it's, it's going the other way, and I don't see what's going to turn it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So an, another really important insight of yours and well known in economics, but maybe not known as much outside of economics is that regulation often induces behavior that offsets the intent of the regulation. Mm -hmm. And so you have a very famous study where you showed that requiring safety equipment to be put in automobiles did not increase automobile safety. Um, you also have highlighted how the Americans with Disabilities Act results in less disabled people being hired uh, how the that's they, not me. That's that's uh, that's the follow -up right. But I've that. seen you discuss that, and then and yes. then how the Endangered Species Act has the potential to increase deforestation and increase yes. uh, suburban yeah. sprawl. So why do these kinds of things happen? Can you explain that a little? Yes. Bit? Yeah. Uh, they're all examples of the first. So so the the uh, 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 the basic idea is very simple. It's econ. It's what you study in econ one. If you make something less costly, people will tend to do more of it. So the 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 safety regulation of that era, uh, and to to a large extent still today, what it does is it makes the consequences of. Uh, uh, getting into an accident, doing things that have accident risk, it, it makes it makes it less costly. So you'll do more of it. So what ha what I found, I mean, we're talking about techniques that are fifty years old, and I would be embarrassed to use today. But what I found was that uh, the uh, uh, a decade of requiring seat belts to be installed and, and uh, pop out windshields and collapsible steering, all this stuff, which reduces the consequences of getting into an accident led to more accidents and more uh, uh, deaths uh, due to the accidents outside the car. You, you were buckled up and you survived, but the pedestrian who was crossing and you weren't so motivated to pay attention, they got, they got, uh, they got hurt. Uh, so that was very, you can imagine, quite controversial. But it did, wh wh why we're here today still talking about it is not because of that particular result. It, because it, it it led people to look at for the to see if the general point had some merit. If you reduce some kind of risk, you're making it more likely that people will take that risk. And that's the example of the American Disabilities Act, which wasn't my work or the Endangered Species Act. There was a lot of other uh, applications which uh, uh, are stunning in their variety to me. I, uh, I, I should have uh, set up a website when, when you could, with examples of this kind of thing, but I didn't. I'm not that ambitious to, to, to do things like that. But it, it's had a, an enormous range of applications. I mean, even to my, my uh, 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 John mentioned that I. Uh, studied financial regulation. It's a very good example of the same principle. The government tries to make the financial system less risky 
So it induces the banks to take more risk because the customers are going to be covered and they don't care. They don't withdraw their deposits like they used to in the old days if you take excessive risk. Uh, and you get a financial crisis every 20 years or so. So, so, so it's got an, it's, it's, it's the fact that the idea, which is basic economics, nothing more, has so many applications that I think accounts for its in, endurance. So do you think that, so how much do you think regulatory agencies think about that simple principle when they're, you know, when they're well, I know, I know about automobiles because I was involved in the pushback and in the back and forth. The, the, they go through a, a process. It, 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 it's like when a good friend dies. You first there's denial, or when you, you're told that you're going to die, you know, you deny it. And the, then you slowly accept it. And then maybe you do something about it. So that's that's what's kind of happened uh, with with offsetting behavior, which is the whole topic we're we're talking about. the 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 first instinct is to deny it, and they still do. Uh, or they'll show you, well, look, look, the 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 death rate is going down, and and uh, uh, that's because we have seatbelts. They didn't. They didn't tell you it was going down a lot before, you know. Uh, so you have that, uh, uh, and then you have uh, some recognition in that area, more recognition in other areas. So right now you have a very good example of this big debate in the community. They've added a lot of, and I believe, very valuable safety equipment, forward collision automatic braking, all sorts of stuff. It just in the last few years and, and the act, the death rate has gone up and they're tearing their hair out. Uh, and then some people are telling them, well, you should have expected it. And you know why people are doing that. They're, they're driving, you know, that they're, they're taking less care. Uh, uh, and the instinct there is when you when you accept that there is the problem, there should be another engineering fix, and it goes on and on. So you get you get one generation of fix, and then you get another one. And I, I'm not against that. I'm just telling you, you should be aware in advance that you're going to have the problem that I, I, I that we're discussing. Yeah, interesting. Um, so I'd like to mention, talk about Mansur Olson. So Mansur Olson, graduate of NDSU, grew up in Buxton, a small town near here, uh, has known, was known as a very interdisciplinary uh, thinker, thinking about big issues. Uh, he was also an inspiration for the formation of the Chali Institute. So I'm wondering, could you talk a little bit about the influence of Mansur Olson's work on, on your work? Uh, Mansur was a uh, he died too young. He was a great influence on on uh, me, and you should all be proud to be going to a school that he he uh, went to. Uh, he he delivered a, a key ingredient in the development of the line of theory that, let's say, starts with Stigler and then continues. I I had a part in. Other people had it a part in to explain why it is that broad groups like all of us consumers are not going to be an important constituency for the regulatory agency. Subgroups of us can be because we have, we, we're better able to overcome what he called the collective action problem, which is that when you start when, you, when, when you're dealing with regulation, if it's application to regulation, you have to organize to present your interest to the regulator. And look, I, if, if I said, hey, I'm starting a 
lobby to represent all consumers in the regulation of electric rates in the in the uh, in the regulatory commission in North Dakota, uh, and I'm collecting. You wouldn't, you know, you would you you would either say he's a fool, or if he succeeds, why should I pay? I'll just get the benefit of the uh, of the. Uh, of the of the lobbying without paying, and it will collapse. That was the insight Manser had, and it's a key ingredient in understanding why it is that necessarily, if you set up a regulatory agency, the pressures on it, the information that it receives, all of it, even the. Uh, we talk about the revolving door, the employment opportunities that the regulators are going to have when they decide to move on in life. All of that is going to tilt very heavily to groups that can overcome that free, that's called the free rider problem that Manser, Manser first really unearthed uh, it in, a, in a forceful way in his, his book, The Logic of Collective Action. So it's a key ingredient in this whole, I, I wouldn't be here if he, he hadn't had that insight. Uh, 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 so again, you should all be proud. You should clap for him, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so you've had a really interesting long career as well. And yeah. I'd like to ask you some, some questions about your career. So. Uh, First of all, uh, as was in your bio, uh, you were the senior staff economist on the President's Council of Economic Advi Advisors during the yeah. Nixon administration. And uh, you actually were tasked with the responsibility of looking at the possibility of deregulating surface transportation, railroads, and trucking. And I'm wondering, could you talk about your experience in, yeah. with that? Yes, the, I, I'm going to preface it by telling you if you're if if, if you're thinking about a, a career in in industry, I would advise you to do that. To have, put put in a year working for the government. It's an incredible learning experience. It was for me. It certainly was for me. And and this this area of uh, transportation regulation is a perfect example. Uh, I, I really learned about interest groups and organize, uh, organi uh, organized interests from, uh, from that uh, uh, experience. As, as John points out, we, uh, uh, I, I was on the Council of Economic Advisors staff. I was the chair of an interagency committee, which was, which was told, look into this. Why were we supposed to look into this? Well, things were not going well for the transportation, for a lot of the transportation industries. Surface transportation, which is railroads and your, uh, your micro trucks, and also barges, but but uh, sorry, your micro. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, oh. Can you hear me? Did you hear the last thing I was telling about tr trucks and barges? All right. So so we had we had. Uh, am I okay now? All right. So, so the uh, uh, surface transportation was performing very badly. Uh, the railroads were going broke. The uh, 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 the, the uh, in, in the Northeast, and then it was spreading to this part of the country. Uh, uh, Congress was already having to appropriate money to subsidize it, directly and indirectly. So we got the, the call, look into, uh, you know, look into the regulation, what, what should we do, and so on and so forth. So the, the education that I got was how hard this was. I mean, here was an industry where it was clear to most economists who had looked at it, without much exception, that uh, the railroads, which were the, the key to this, uh, uh, were overbuilt. They had to be shrunk down. They had to specialize in what they were good at, which was getting stuff over a long distance. It was very clear what, what direction we needed to head. But 
you know, nobody was very excited about this. And we had one very uh, strong opposition. There was one big beneficiary, which was the truckers were able to pick off the most lucrative freight from the railroads. They wanted, they were perfectly happy with the system, but no, it wasn't working very well. And anyway, we're going along and it's a very hard slog, but we're making progress. Gradually, we're getting the political people to come behind us. Uh, uh, you learn about interest groups. You're, you try to get the interest groups lined up. We, we were making some progress. Uh, and this is, this is well into my year. One day I get a call. It's from the somebody in the White House. And he says, yeah, we, we, we need you to come across the street, right, across the street. I was in the executive office building and the other side of the street was the White House. We need you to come across here right now. There's a big meeting. I was used to this kind of stuff by then. I tell you, it's a great learning experience. Uh, so I went across the street and I'm in this big treaty room, the Roosevelt room, but big, very ornate, and there's a big crowd. And before us is the minority leader of the house standing there. And he said, you know, I called this meeting uh, to tell you to back off. The, uh, the, see, the, 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 the Nixon was the president. He was a Republican and the, the, the Republicans were in the minority in, the, in Congress. So they, uh, believe it or not, the game was to get enough Democrat co cooperation to pass legislation. So it was, it was much more uh, 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 picking off the opposition instead of having just two warring camps. So, so he, stand, he said, I want you to back off. And the reason is you got 435 scared congressmen up there. And uh, uh, if you push this, my folks are going to have to take a very tough vote and uh, you're going to get no democratic uh, support. The, 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 the Teamsters Union has made it clear what they're going to do. I don't want to go into the details. He went into the, to some of the details just to, to scare the bejesus out of us. Uh, but but uh, he said, uh, look, they're going to make it very, very tough. We have a whole agenda and we need to drop this right now. And game was over. So my, my year resulted in no, no real movement on, on uh, surface transportation. Now, I, I don't know how many of you know the subsequent history, but within 10 years, everything we were saying came true. But not then. I was shot out of the water. Many years later, uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Paul McAvoy, who was a, uh, 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 a noted economist in this area. And, and uh, 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 later he became uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. I was just a lowly staff member. He became chairman uh, uh, during the Ford administration, about five years, four years after the events that I just described. And we were comparing notes on uh, uh, our experience at, at, at the council. And uh, Paul told me that uh, he, he came. He came to Washington, and the very next day, he got a call from Ford had replaced Nixon, uh, who had resigned, 
and uh, he was he was trying to to f- feel his way in office. Uh, uh, Ford called Paul McAvoy into his office, and he said, "You know what? I know that you people in the Council of Economic Advisors are studying transportation deregulation." Paul, I want you to make that your top priority, and I want you to have a bill on my desk in 18 months. Uh, That's what Paul did. Now, some of you may be old enough to know the history. Gerald Ford was exactly the minority leader of the Republican Party delegation in Congress who told me, in so many words, kill it. So that's, you you learn a lot uh, (laughs) playing the Washington game. Let me tell you, some of of my colleagues learn so much, they stay there forever. I, I was glad to be out of it. But it's a it's a it's a good tale to the, see. It's the same guy Ford, but here it is five years later. It's a completely different set of circumstances. The railroad industry is going down the tubes even more, and they're paying billions now to cover the losses. And it's a, a, a time of accelerating inflation. He wants he wants a he wants to show he's doing something to to lower prices in one sector. So he's he's president. He's not majority leader. It's the same man, a hundred eighty degree different uh, attitude toward regulation. So uh, people say uh, ideology counts for a lot, and it does, but it's it can be quite flexible. Yeah, that's that's a great story. <laughs> um, so uh, you, every year, you're named as one of the favorites for the Nobel Prize based on your pioneering work uh-huh. in in regulation. And uh, you, I also just I pointed this out to you uh, last night or the night before that I saw an article recently, mm-hmm. and they were mapping the connections between Nobel Prize winners and people that haven't won the Nobel Prize yet. And you're the number one connected person <laughs> to people that have won the Nobel Prize. And so I'm wondering, do you think, uh, I mean, do you oftentimes think about like, what would it be like? Uh, do you anticipate the call from the Nobel Committee every year? So what, what are your thoughts on, on winning a Nobel Prize? Uh, the answer to the last question is no, I do not. But, but l- l- let me say, I would be very flattered to get the, the Nobel Prize. I'm, I don't want to, with that flip answer, I don't want to say anything uh, different. Uh, 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 I I, I do know a lot of the folks who got the Nobel Prize. Uh, Probably I've lasted a long time, so I I get to know that. But but I think my life will go on pretty much the same either way, whether it happens or it doesn't happen. I'm not indifferent. I don't want to say that. But I've known people who are obsessed by it. Like they wait, they they wait up, and you know the the they make their decision in Europe, and and it's the, the day is uh, 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 not started yet here. So they wait up all night to get the. That's I'm not going to do that. Uh, it, it, I'm not saying it doesn't matter that much, but uh, uh, uh you know, I have a life to live and I'm not going to give it away to worrying about whether I get a Nobel, Nobel Prize or, or not. Uh, certainly, I'm not going to go down the route of uh, this poor man who, who, who uh, just a few years ago didn't get it and committed suicide. I mean, that's, that's absurd. That's mm-hmm. tragic. Uh, at least I think so. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, if it happens, I'll be, it's okay. If it doesn't, that's, there've been, you, you talk about uh, uh, people who didn't get it and should have. Mansour Olson did not get the Nobel. 
he should have. A lot of people, a lot of people other than me who should have and didn't. And I, I, I'm humbled by that thought. Well, that's that's a great attitude, but I hope you get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Thanks. Thanks, but I'm not going to wait up. <laughs> so just a related question is, so you've been exposed, and as I alluded to already, so I mean, you've worked with, you know, Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, um, George Stigler, Ronald Coase, I mean, all kinds of Nobel Prize winners. So what, what did that mean to your career, do you think, to work with so many Nobel well, obviously, it shaped it. Uh, uh, I, I was in a pretty good position when I was uh, the, the age of a lot of the folks in this audience in that uh, I could go to almost any graduate program that I, I chose. The, the, that was partly me. It was also partly that the money was flowing. The government was worried about uh, building up academia uh, the money was flowing. You could you could, you you could get financial aid anywhere, and I chose Chicago, and that put me in contact with these uh, uh, people. Every one of them had a uh, uh, defining kind of influence on my uh, uh, life. And it would take it would take really too long to go case by case by case. But uh, 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 I, I can't even say that one had a dominating influence. You would think it would be Stigler because I followed in his, uh, I, I modified his regulation theory and it, 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 it became more the uh, the, the the canonical theory of regulation. I've I've done work in industrial organization, which is a related field, uh, which is which he was a a, a key figure in. Uh, uh, so you would think it's Stigler, but I, I would say uh, yes, there was a very important influence. But Friedman had an important influence. Ronald Coase. That you that you meant had a very important influence on on my life. I am now connected. The only way I'm connected officially to the profession is as an editor of the Journal of Law and Economics, which for a long time was Ronald Coase's journal. And I, I every day I am conscious that I sit in the chair that Ronald Coase sat in. Uh, uh, and, and I try to to maintain some of the attitude and uh, 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 program that Ronald envisioned for the for the journal. Uh, I probably interacted with him on a one to one basis more than any of the others because he was he he lasted he he lasted beyond a hundred and. Mm -hmm sharp as a tack till the very end. So we had a lot of stuff to discuss uh, over time. And Gary Becker, you, you, uh, another great uh, uh, influence, although I would, uh, frankly, not as important as, as the three that I've uh, mentioned. So uh, yeah, it helps to be in that kind of environment that it does... It, it did have a, 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 a I would say, I couldn't be who I am or was or whatever uh, without that, without that history. It's awesome. Yeah. So you've done a lot of great research and have a lot of great insights as well. So I think it'd be great to, to ask you about some current issues. And so uh, recently, uh, it was last March, actually, that an FDA review panel um, a new ALS drug had come out for Lou Gehrig's disease to treat Lou Gehrig's disease. It had showed some promise that it could extend people's lives and improve the quality of their lives as well. Uh, the FDA review panel in March voted to deny this drug approval, saying that they needed more proof that it was effective. Um, and then in June, it was actually approved in Canada. And, and that's, so then uh, a week ago, this FDA review a panel actually reversed uh, their decision and said they do want it to be approved now. But then we could also look a year ago. Um, I don't know if people remember there was an Alzheimer's drug that was approved and it has received heavy criticism. The FDA has received heavy criticism for approving it. 
based, the critics say that it hasn't been proven to be effective. And so you've done some work uh, about the efficacy requirement that FDA has about yeah. drug approval. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts on this. Are. Okay. So I, 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 sh- I, you're right. I've been, uh, uh, I've been involved in this. That study was 50 years ago. So I've been involved in some way uh, for 50 years. And it, it was, uh, uh, it's, it's one that I'm more proud of than the average. It was the first cost benefit analysis of, uh, regulation. Uh, and I've been a critic of FDA regulation for all of that period. So we, we have to, how much time do we have? Ah, we have, we have time. Okay. So I got to explain what it is. He said, uh, John said the efficacy requirements. So there's a history here. You got to, you got, you have to understand what modern drug regulation is all about. Uh, in 1962, and I'm not going to go into the previous history, which led to this, which is also interesting and has iron, ironic twist. In 1962, Congress decided that the Food and Drug Administration needed to certify that a drug was A, safe, and B, efficacious before C, it could get sold on the ordinary medical market, which is basically selling to doctors and today to insurance companies. Okay, so up to that time, A was on the books. B was added and needed to be defined. What does efficacious? Well, it was defined to mean that you have to come, you are the drug uh, researcher, manufacturer, prospective seller. You have to come to the FDA and you have to tell the FDA what you're going to claim. So you're going to claim a cure or a mitigation of ALS, as in this example. Okay. Then you have to sit down with the FDA and you have to map out a testing regimen that will start with A and then get to B. That is, you have to show it's safe and then you're you're allowed to test for efficacy. And that that means that you uh, typically what you do is you, all of this is back and forth in negotiation with the regulator. You, you, you set up a random control trial where there's a treatment group, there's a control group, okay? In this case, the control group might be ALS patients who are not going to get this drug. They're going to get whatever the you do for ALS patients without this drug. Then you get this treatment group, and then you give them the drug and at the end of the random control trial, which is specified in the regulatory document that you're negotiating with the FDA, uh, you have an outcome. And uh, let's say that the uh, treatment group did better, but the risk you, uh, uh, if you've taken an elementary course in statistics, you know what I'm talking about. The risk of making an error of saying it did better when it really didn't is 6%. You can't market it because the, 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 uh, the, the protocol usually says we read a statistics textbook and they use 5%. That's the rule forever since uh, Ronald Fisher started uh, uh, this branch of statistics. You promised 5%. You came up with 6 No, No, you can't sell it. So that's, the, that's the, the regime. You have to pass. It's called stage three, which is the efficacy test. All right. Now, if you think about it, that has a benefit. It keeps some drugs which really don't work off the market by any stretch of the imagination. But then you have to ask, why would the seller have gone through all the trouble 
of uh, spending the money on the uh, stage three trial if they really feared that that would be the outcome. So that's not going to be a common uh, a, a problem. You'll also catch risks that you can catch in a in a trial. Uh, 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 safety risks that you 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 didn't know about before but they turn up later you can you'll catch a few of those and that's the benefit the cost is the opportunity you, you have an enormously expensive process which costs resources but the biggest cost is the opportunity cost that is to say it takes time to do all of this we know what the time is from application to a, approval or rejection. That's uh, in itself a year and a half. Oh, it's a, so we have an application, which means the seller thinks they got something. They're, and and they think they have willing customers and they like to get approval. And then it takes a year and a half and this is after the stage three trial is finished and the Food and Drug Administration evaluates the results and it goes to a, an advisory panel. There's a whole process of back and forth with the data. And uh, then they approve or disapprove. So that's, that is the biggest cost. But the incentives are at this point, very heavily in favor of that drug having at least some beneficial effect, often a very beneficial, life-saving effect. And in effect, that, can, that benefit can't be uh, had for a year and a half minimum while they uh, evaluate uh, the data. And empirically, that opportunity cost overwhelms everything. So you've had, for example, great advances in uh, 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 heart disease. Uh, a, a lot of them are, are pharmaceutical advances. Heart disease kills hundreds of thousands of people, even today, every single year. You can imagine you get a you get a drug that can reduce that by a few thousand, and you wait a year and a half. You're killing thousands of people. Effectively, that's what you're doing. It's a death sentence for thousands of people, and the benefits there are benefits, but they're overwhelmed by this. So you get the, it becomes, look, the FDA is a political creature. It becomes a political game. Can I, uh, can I bring pressure on the FDA to speed up? Can I do this or can I do that to make approval more likely? And so on and so forth. And the FDA sometimes responds. But again, you got the collective action problem, Manser Olson's problem. Unless you're organized, you can't get them to move, uh, except that in crisis. So you, you might remember a couple of years ago, we started developing uh, vaccines uh, for, for COVID. And you had op so-called Operation Warp Speed which a couple of my colleagues were very heavily involved. You know what warp speed really was? It was telling the FDA that if we get some positive results, we're going to uh, short circuit the process. So uh, you had an emergency use authorization. You know what an emergency use or, or, or It says we're not at the end of stage three, but look, we're going to be blown out of the water politically if we don't say yes. So we're going to we're going to we're going to say yes. You can use it. My very strong view is that every drug should have an emergency use use or uh, authorization, including these ALS drugs. 
you know, they might not work. They might work a little bit. You know, suppose I'm a doctor and I, 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 I read that it has potential benefits. Not yet. It, the stage three hasn't been complete. The FDA is gestating the data. Okay. I'm a doctor. I have this patient. ALS is a death sentence today. The FDA is telling me I cannot get that drug unless I go, I, I can I can apply for an emergency use or authorization and so on. But but uh, uh, who am I, an, an ordinary doctor, to play that game? Uh, the drug company would have to do it, and the drug company is going to have to deal with the FDA many times in the future. Uh, they're very conservative about that. They don't want to they don't want to get in bad with the regulator who has their future at, at, at stake. So it's not going to happen unless they go to Canada. And I don't know how absurd is that? The Canadians are dumber than we are about drugs. Anyway, I could go on, but, but uh, uh, it, it's a good example of, of uh, 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 where the broad interest really isn't represented. Uh, uh, it, it, there's no way, the, the, the interest that's represented is the drug companies uh, who have, they, 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 once they apply, they want to get approval. If they have a drug that's approved, they don't want the competitor to get approved. So they, they're, not, uh, they're not opponents of the system. They've learned how to use it. Uh, and you got you've got a medical establishment, research establishment that has some uh, weight because uh, they sit on these panels that evaluate the data. And that's a pretty pretty nice life's work. Uh, and you have consultants who try to push things through, and you have an industry which, if you have a drug startup, you're going to end up selling out to one of the big drug companies only because they can get the stuff through the process. And you can't. So uh, 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 there's really no prospect that except in crisis, like the COVID uh, crisis or previously the AIDS epidemic in the, in, the, in the 1980s, which did lead to organized political action. Uh, it was uh, a, a small group was bearing the biggest cost. They organized and they got enough pressure on the FDA to accelerate uh, the process. But uh, the process will continue. And I think it, it's one of, one of the few things that I feel pretty strongly about. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a death sentence for thousands of people. Uh, 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 but it's not going to change. I'm realistic. It, it's going to go on uh, uh, pretty much as it is now. Yeah, an important uh, insight. And uh, yeah, too bad it's not going to change. Um, it, Sam at, at uh, dinner the other night said that if I wanted to get him fired up to ask him what <laughs> <Yeah>. especially, <laughs> I think well, I, I expected. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry if I came across no, too. No, not at all. That was great. <laughs> but but uh, no, uh, you're talking about human life. So. You, you see, I, I, I mean, uh, how many of you really knew about the process before I described it in in, in detail? Some of you did, I'm sure. Raise your hands if you knew about the efficacy and what the stage three trial is all about. I see about five hands. See, this is another, here, here's another guy, uh, a compliment to Manser Olson, who should have won the Nobel Prize with Manser, I think, Anthony Downs. So the, you, this is an example of rational ignorance. If, if I were addressing a bunch of drug company executives, all the hands would go up. Of course they know about this. This is, this is their life's work. But, but, but for you as an ordinary uh, consumer, unless you get unfortunately to the stage where you need the experimental therapy to save your life or, or to at least raise the 
the life expectancy by a few months, unless you get to that dire, you're not going to know about this. It doesn't pay for you to, to learn about. You've got a lot of other things in your life to worry about that are more important than how the regulation of drugs is, is, uh, is, is structured. And that's another uh, building block in our theory of regulation. And here's a very good example of it. It's literally killing people and they don't know about it. They can't know, but who, who is it killing? It's killing the person who doesn't get the drug that might've saved his or her life in a period before the FDA announces its decision on whether or not you can, you can, you can get the drug. So, and they don't know who they are. <laughs> so that's, yeah, yeah. That's so that. I, so you're all going to get a chance to ask your own questions of Sam. So I'm going to ask one last question Go ahead, and then, uh, and then as soon as he's done answering this one, make sure you have your, <laughs> your questions ready for Sam. Yeah. Okay. So you can see I'm not bashful. I'll yeah. answer any question you will. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask you a question about uh, Milton Friedman. So I, you had written an article a while back uh, talking about how Milton Friedman, uh, you didn't think that maybe we'd see another Milton Friedman. And one thing that was very unique about Milton Friedman yeah. Very good academic economist, so published in journals, but at the same time, a very famous public intellectual talking about the virtues of free markets. I mean, so a lot of people who are not economists know who Milton Friedman is yes. as well. Um, and you said that maybe the reason we weren't weren't going to have another Milton Friedman, or the reason we didn't, you said you gave a couple reasons. One is that economists tend to focus on much narrower issues; they don't look at like capitalism and freedom and stuff like that. Um, a second reason you gave is that there's not no longer the reflex by society to look to government to, to solve problems. And I'm wondering if your thoughts have changed on it, given the COVID pandemic, because to me, it seems like now society is looking to government to, for solutions to, to everything. So no, you're absolutely right about the second one. Uh, and I, I've already pointed it out in this, in this conversation. Uh, there's been a move back to unquestioning trust, at least in a segment of the population. You know, we're all polarized now and I'm, I'm in a part of the country where this is less true than it is in other parts of the country. But there's been a, there's been a, uh, uh, an upsurge again in, in uh, uh, oh, there's a problem, we have to trust government uh, to solve it. Uh, at the time of that particular interview, that hadn't yet, yeah. at least it wasn't obvious to me that that had, had come. There, there was a, there was a, a, a you're right, a, 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 a period but that part of what we were talking about earlier played into that, that uh, a period in which uh, it became possible to deregulate businesses, to denationalize them in, in, the, in less developed countries and, uh, or, Countries like the United Kingdom, which had a big state sector uh, in in uh, industries, and they privatized a lot of these industries. Then you had public-private partnership, all sorts of ways of uh, offloading uh, uh, government responsibility and ex for for executing various programs onto the private sector and. Uh, uh, also, a uh, I would say an increasing realization that competition in the private sector was more important than we had believed his, historically. Uh, so, so in that sense, I, I was saying Friedman had won his fight. I'm not sure that that's true anymore. Uh, we, if we're not going to get one, I think you know I'm, I'm betraying my prejudices. We probably need one. Uh, 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 so the, uh, uh, the other reason why he was uniquely, I mean, there was, I, I can't think of another economist of his generation who was as good communicating with the uh, general public as he was uh, be being an academic economist. And that came from the way he taught us. He, he taught us 
graduate students. My first graduate course was with Milton Friedman. He taught us very much the same way that you would see him on uh, Free to Choose, his television okay. series, yeah. which uh, and his book. Economics is really very simple. Uh, there are a few basic forces, and what you what you do as an economist is you see, you ask always which basic economic story is involved in this in this phenomenon, and you go and you look and you see if it works. Mentioned the seat belts and the the, the that that's really what it was it, it was. Things cost less, you do more of them. That wasn't any more complicated than that. And uh, uh, economics as a discipline has gotten a, far, far away from that kind of, of view. Uh, maybe for the better, I don't know, maybe not for the better, but uh, that's another reason we're yeah. not going to have. <laughs> do we need another one to do that again? I, I don't, I'm not. I'm less sure about that than I am about we need somebody to <laughs> teach us old lessons uh, uh, again that we're forgetting. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. So if you're if anyone is interested, you just go to free to choose TV actually on the internet and you can <laughs> right, see all the seeing. old series. It, it's really interesting. Oh, you'll, yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll see a lot. Just of remember what you see there is what I got. 60 years ago as a graduate student. It, it's really cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So questions from the audience, please raise your hand and then we have microphone runners that will bring you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Jeff, uh, Turn up the mic. <laughs> uh, when, my best friend, it'll cost at least a billion dollars or more to bring a new drug to market from discovery, et cetera. Yes. And so it's better to win not a lot of opportunity for a count error because you can't error too often. Again, in Europe, they tend to do the process much more quickly. Yeah. I would posit that's because of uh, bureaucrats justifying their existence. What would you say is stupid? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, the, let, let me elaborate on that. It used to be true that other countries did it faster than us. It's not so true anymore. And, and partly for what you, uh, they have followed our model. Because, uh, and, you know, it, it, it appeals to the mentality which says distrusts the private sector, distrusts private decision making between doctors and patients and uh, imposes a scientism. You know, we'll do the, the controlled trial. We'll have a T-test. If T exceeds the magic figure, then you can sell it if it falls below. We, the bureaucracy, will make all these decisions for you, the consumer who doesn't know enough. That model is now in the developed world, especially with the European Union. Uh, there's, a, there's a common set of uh, the European Union decides on this for all of Europe. You don't have competition between the French and the Germans, except, you know, public necessity like COVID, they could deviate. But in the ordinary case, no. The European Union decides for the whole European Union, and it's just as bad there as it is here. The figure you mentioned, a billion, is now an underestimate. Your mic fell again, I'm sorry. My mic is full. Yeah. Uh, the figure you mentioned of a billion is now uh, an underestimate. It's more than a billion. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the year and a half that it takes from phase three to, to decision. That's just the tip of the iceberg. It's 10 years total from uh, initiation of the process to the stage three uh, end point. Uh, and I wasn't even counting that because that's all heavily regulated. You have to, you have to do, you, have, you, 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 you file what's called a new drug application at year minus 10, 
Then you negotiate stage one and stage two, which are the safety stages. Okay. Then you proceed to propose, if, if you pass stage one and stage two, uh, you can propose stage three. Then you have to implement stage three. And most of the billion, uh, whatever the cost is, it's now more like two billion in 10 years. Most of the cost is in stage three. It's in recruiting patients for the con randomized control trial, uh, 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 lobbying the FDA to, to, to let the trial go on when somebody in the FDA wants to stop it, which they can do overnight. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the opportunity cost is much bigger than I let on, but it, it's enough to make my point. And uh, unfortunately, you're behind on that. It used to be the case that we could talk about a significant, what was called the drug lag. Not only the Canadians, but the British and the French and the Germans were getting stuff on the market earlier. It's it's now sometimes it is earlier, sometimes it's even later, and 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 it, it it it's 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 more than it used to be in the past. It takes more time all over the world. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Doctor Pelsman, for your talk. Um, one of your main themes, I think, is has to do with unintended consequences. Yes. Uh, my dad had a way to simplify that even more. He would say, in the end, everything is self-defeating. Now, the specific question for you, we had a research company. We have a research company in Fargo here, and a lot of us participated in the COVID phase three trials through that company. Oh, I didn't know that. And so a lot of us kept real careful track of Operation Warp Speed and how that worked. And I was surprised to find out a couple of months ago, maybe this is not true, maybe it is, that one of the elements of getting emergency youth, uh, use authorization for a drug is you must show that there's no effective alternative. Um, if that's true, then that leads to what I'm wondering about. There's a, a lot of people around that say that with Operation Warp Speed, um, in order to get the emergency youth, uh, use authorization, there couldn't be an effective alternative. And that's why things like hydroxychloroquine and other things never had any traction mm -hmm. because if they had been seen as effective, that would have been the end of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And of course there were billions of dollars behind that effort. Yes. And there was a real political effort to have an effective vaccine. What do you know about that? I, I don't know very much about that. I wasn't involved in it. I have colleagues. I could ask a couple of people I know who were involved uh, 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 about that. Uh, but uh, look, there was no way. I don't care what the alternatives were. There was no way they were going to deny an emergency use authorization in the circumstances of the, the, the FDA would have been told you're going to do this or you're going to be replaced as the head of the FDA. I mean, we, we were really, you know, there was a panic in the country about COVID. And here was some glimmer of promise. Now, if you're asking me what I would have done had I had the power as an ordinary citizen, I would say, you want to take hydroxychloroquine? Go ahead. Go ahead. You, Pfizer, want to do a, a randomized control trial? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 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 and, and if it shows promise, we'll let you sell it, and 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 uh, 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 we'll we'll iterate from that point. And similarly with the hydroxychloroquine. So I, I don't know the details, but I do know that the process was uh, highly politicized. So I can believe everything you're telling me. Uh, and the FDA was kind of dragged along. And even, even with the, the EUA, 
you look at the time sequence of that, okay? So he, here is the, th the time sequence. It's the week before the election or the week of Pfizer uh, 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 comes out with its phase three trial results. I did a quick back of the envelope uh, calculation. I, I saw the results. It, it was very clear that any statistical standard that you wanted to impose on that phase on that trial, it passed with flying colors. The FDA, now this could have been that it was prevailed on by somebody politically. The, the White House wanted to get it out there. FDA said, you know what? We need a couple more months. And they got it. A death sentence for thousands of people. For what? They got a couple more months to fool around. Now, it, it, it coincidentally or not, it was the time of the election and I don't want to get into the possibilities. Uh, I, I don't know. But uh, it just illustrates, it's, it certainly illustrates the mentality of the regulation. And uh, 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 I'm glad, personally glad that they did the emergency use authorization. And you had the choice. You don't like the vaccine, I think. You should Don't take it. But uh, I was ready. A lot of other millions of people were ready on November 8th when the data first came out. So it's a short answer. I don't know. <laughs> other questions? Yeah, turn it on. Tap on it. Shout. <laughs> you're, you're a big, strong boy. Shout. <laughs> of the Endangered Species Act. Oh, yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, so here's the story with the Endangered Species Act. Uh, again, you need some background. What, what is the Endangered Species Act? It, uh, 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 the Fish and Wildlife Service determines that a certain species is endangered and it puts it on a list for protection. What, what that means is that the habitat of the endangered species is has has to be preserved. You can't develop it or cut cut it down or 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 drain it if it's a swamp or whatever. You have to preserve the habitat uh, uh, for so long as the species remains on the list. So so the classic study is uh, again it published in my journal, the Journal of Law and Economics, the red cockaded woodpecker. You know what a red cockaded woodpecker is? I, you do? <laughs> Good. So, so are, you a, are you a forestry uh, student or something? Oh, okay, okay. So the red cockaded woodpecker, I learned as an editor of the Journal of Law and Economics, not as a student, it, it lives in forests in, in the south, uh, pine forests, and uh, 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 it got put on this endangered species list. So you had, you had uh, uh, owners of uh, uh, forests who uh, 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 were affected by being put on the endangered species list. Now, if your forest was habitat for the woodpecker, you couldn't do anything. 
So the, 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 the woodpecker was fine. The trouble is that it flies, right? So suppose you got this forest down the road, which is not yet habitat for the woodpecker, but might be if somebody discovers a woodpecker on your property. What, so what's, what's your incentive? And you're, you're, you've studied forestry and you know about uh, yields and, 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 and you should cut down the trees gradually or, or according to uh, the underlying economics, comparing interest rates and growth. All that goes out the window. Your incentive is you better cut all those trees down very fast until, unless you get a woodpecker up habitating in the, the trees. And the study found that that's exactly what happened. The, 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 the cutting of trees accelerated. The incidence of clear cutting forests increased uh, 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 substantially. So you can think of that as the possibly unintended consequence of, uh, of uh, mitigating the risk to the woodpeckers. Some, somebody offset it by cutting down trees. Uh, do they, they must eat bugs, right? <laughs> Are they hungry? They're real hungry, yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Cheryl Wackenheim. Hi, and Cheryl. Um, another example of the Endangered Species Act at, as, as a farm kid raised up, I was, clearly told that there are no endangered species. We did not see them um, because the complications are, are enormous for people. So it, it's one of those government things, I think, where you, you have the opportunity, there is the opportunity to help something, a species, a bug, a plant, whatever it is, but nobody's going to admit they have it because it shuts everything down. But my question for you, we have the uh, nurses strike in down in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities. We have the Diverted, now now it's taken care of, but the rail strike, the nationwide rail strike, we have the teacher strikes. When should the government at the federal level or the state level get involved? And what kind of criteria should we use to decide when that is? Uh, 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 it, it, it's too broad a question to answer. And, and you want me to, if you want me to talk about teachers. Should, I'll, I'll talk about the rail strike. So the rail strike, it's a COVID issue and it's an international trade issue. The rails shutting down right now would have major economic consequences across the U S and, and our covers our export markets. Should yeah. the federal government intervene or, or just let it happen intervene? I mean, beyond. Suggesting. I don't know enough about that particular case. Should the, the, should the, 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 the the, the, the bigger question is, should the federal government be responsible for rail transportation? That's the first question we <laughs> that I, I had to address. And my, my answer there is no. I think that by and large, the, 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 the government getting out of the railroad business has by and large been beneficial. Uh, 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 the funny thing is that the railroad industry as it's structured today is now more afraid of re-regulation than, uh, than it was afraid of deregulation when I was worrying about it. And uh, 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 how that plays into the structure of unions in that industry and, and uh you know, my, my understanding is that there's, there was like 10 unions were involved and eight or nine of them had said yes, but two of them said no, and they were willing to go to the brink. I, I can't, I, 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 and I can't answer in the short run, should we not have a strike for a few days? There's a provision in the law which says the federal government can cool things off for 30 days. That's too much detail, I think, for us to go into today. But I think if we take signals like that, 
teacher strikes or rail strikes as, as, a, as a signal to get the government further involved, I think it's a mistake. I, I think the way one handles the, and it's moving in that direction actually, is to have more competition than less. Uh, and, and that means a reduced, not not a zero, not a not a completely government pullback from education, but but a reduced uh, uh, a role. Uh, uh, and I think that's happening. The COVID experience has led to a a, a, a massive change that that we're only beginning to understand. And it's it's kind of reflected in these t- this t- teacher unrest. There's a lot of parent unrest too uh, that that's feeding into this. So that's an area where, perversely, I'm a little bit optimistic. And with the railroads, you know, uh, in the short run, it might feel good to stop them from working things out. But uh, in the long run, have having the government reduce its uh, role in the railroads has been a big plus for, for, for us. And it's, it's been, it's been copied a little bit outside of the U S and I think uh, they probably envy our railroad situation uh, on balance. Bring the mic. So yeah, but talk to them. Talk to them, and so my question would be, and, and with, or talk to me, and I'll tell them what the okay, question, question is. With the regulations that all these guys that are, are are putting it in, we're printing like trillions of dollars, which is regulated by the Fed. I'm assuming. Yes. How yeah. are we ever going to survive printing trillions of dollars, or ever be able to pay it back? And our president tells you who is going over. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll paraphrase the question. Yeah. The, the 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 question is we've uh, uh, we've uh, inflated the money supply by an enormous amount to pay for uh, increased regulation, which was part of the question. But but it's also true. The biggest reason for it is to pay for just increased government payments to, 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 uh, for government programs. So there's been a big expansion of government, bottom line, financed by money printing. What do I think of that? Well, I am not a monetary economist, okay? And I could just stop there. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. But let me tell you something. Uh, 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 you're right. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, there was a huge deficit. How do you finance a deficit? Well, you have some options. The option chosen was to print money or the functional equivalent of it in the electronic era. Uh, at that point, I am very naive about these things. So I I called my uh, macroeconomic colleagues and I said, you know what? We're going to have an inflation shock. You better get ready. And they said, oh, don't worry. And, and, you know, uh, the problem is deflation, not inflation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I personally uh, hedged my bets by, uh, I, I, I told everybody on my block, buy, buy I bonds, inflation bonds. The government, the government will protect you against inflation and pay you zero interest, but it's going to be better than what's going to happen otherwise. And I was right. So I, the, the answer to your question is we are living through right now the consequence of that decision to finance expansion of government by money printing and in the inflation that we're endured. 
the, uh, the, 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 the other side of it is the Federal Reserve, which you're ap also absolutely right, is entirely responsible for that. Not entirely. They feel political pressure to make it easy for the government to fulfill its fiscal destiny. Uh, but they are the ones in control. They have now pulled back. You will have a recession and B, an inflation, the inflation will start coming back down. When I can't tell you, I am humble uh, uh, and I'm not a macroeconomist. And if I were a macroeconomist and I told you when, I'd be lying to you. So uh, I'm telling you it's going to happen sometime next year, maybe. Uh, 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 we're, we're probably at a peak and it's going to taper off. Uh, but probably, you know, there's a lot of risk in that statement. Uh, 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 and we're going to have a recession. And we already are. We have had two quarters of, of zero growth. It's going to be a weird recession where, where uh, the, uh, the first one in my long lifetime where the unemployment rate isn't seriously going up. Very weird. You go up and down Broadway and you see all these signs were hiring, hiring. But uh, output is going down. So, so, uh, 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 so we're, we're bearing the consequences already. Going forward, we have a long run issue about how you're going to finance all the promises made by, by uh, uh, the government. Uh, one possibility is to regulate more. Uh, that's one that I, I see a lot of pressure for increasing regulation. You know, the government can spend money or it can tell you how to spend money. That's called regulation. There's a great temptation when you have the inflationary consequences of just printing money to cover the cost, well, we got to do something else. That something else could include more regulation. But I don't know. I'm just I'm flagging these issues for all of you uh, going forward. Okay, so we have time for one more question, I believe. So. Hey, I'm going to stick around so you can ask me questions out there. Yeah. Let's say you have done so much data. Give, give, give him the, give, take the mic and see if it works. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah. So you have done so much great work on smart transportation, uh, basically surface transportation and transportation acts. So I would like to ask for your opinion uh, against an infrastructure act that was released on November last year that says that uh, uh, basically drunk and driving act by 2026, all of the new autonomous vehicle or motor vehicle would be launched with embedded drunk and driving sensors. So no drunk people would be allowed to basically when someone is drunk and the car detects it, the car will be pulled over to the side of road or yes. it will turn on the hazardous lights. So what is your opinion on this? Basically, government has issued, I believe, uh, $1.2 trillion to make it happen. So what is your opinion yeah. about this? That What would be the basically consequences? The, you all heard the question. So, so, so the, 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 the government is going to now put a breathalyzer in front of you. And if you don't pass the test, it's going to stop the car. Look. It's going to lead to more drinking, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, 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 I don't have to. I don't have to worry about getting into an, a crash. The car is going to stop for me. So, 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 uh, 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 it's not going to lead necessarily to less drunk drivers. It's going to lead to probably the opposite. So, look, all I can tell, I don't know how the net benefits of that. It, it sounds like a big number. Is it really a trillion dollars to make this happen? I can't believe that. It can't be that. Anyway, there's a, there's a benefit. Some accidents are not going to happen that would have happened. There's a, there's a cost, which is that there will be offsetting behavior. 
right? A anytime, look, a, 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 an even bigger, broad principle about regulation than if you make things uh, less costly, you're going to get more of them, is uh, that, that regulation always prevents a deal between two people that they want to make, you know? And if if if, if 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 they if the if the driver and General Motors and Toyota didn't want to make that deal, I got to worry about why should I make them want to make that deal? They're going to offset the, whoever it is, General Motors, the driver. They're going to offset some of that because they didn't want to make the deal in the first place. And it's going to be with more drink, less attention, less attention to when you drive, who drives, who you drive with. There's going to be less, less attention to that. People are going to get into a car that otherwise wouldn't get into a car. Oh, he's drunk. I don't want to drive with him. Oh, he's drunk. I can get into the car and the car will take care of it. So you're going to have offsetting behavior on many margins. How's it going to work out? Well, they're going to try. They're going to try and you'll see. I, I would say the only thing I would say is less well than they think it will if you do not take account of the offsetting behavior. That's all I can say. Well, this has been spectacular. I mean, we could, I could sit here all afternoon listening to you talk. And, <laughs> and anyway, so well, we can everyone have, give a I'll be around tomorrow. Class. We could reconvene. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.